Hello guys, welcome back to Roger's Make, it's Marco here, and today we speed paint a bunch of zombies in the second episode of the Cursed City series. Painting different blocks of enemies of a board game or units with a substantially different look in an army, I like to use different approaches and techniques to give them their own character, and still working with a cohesive theme and the same general mood make them unique. This helps the gameplay, making every piece easy to identify on the board, and boosts the storytelling of warbands and armies that gather fighters from different sources, and don't have the same mass-produced uniform on every model. I painted Gorslav and his horde of Deadwalker zombies the same day of the Wolf and Watch skeletons, following this idea of making them different while keeping the same grimy look and dark mood. Having fresh in mind the macro and micro management of the steps on the skeletons helped defining this uh, different path, and I'll often explain my choices for the zombies referring to the Wolf and Watch, so I suggest you to consider these two episodes like a single one. I have red elements that link the unit to the general heraldry, with the most powerful red detail on the hero, but instead of using a very limited palette like I did on the skeletons to boost their uniform regimental look, I used an impressionistic variety of different tones to create the flowing shades of rotting flesh, more visual diversity, and the illusion of non-uniformity, still keeping the whole work under the 4 hours. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to always know what happens on the channel. And if you want to support my work, like, comment, share, watch another video, and maybe check my Patreon page, where you can find the real-time footage of my videos, with every single little line and brushstroke. Thanks a million, guys! I start priming the models with a desaturated matte light blue. Because of the volumes, shapes and poses of these models, I don't feel the need of the super strong black and white contrast I set for the skeletons underpainting, and I can use the first layer of paint to deliver more chromatic sensations, that in this case are more important than the volumetric information. For my usual black priming, I use the black color of the Molotov one for all line, so it doesn't matter what color I use, I have always the same good grab, high resistance and general physical properties. The idea behind this blue is to set from the beginning an underlying, subtle, cold sensation, able to passively tone down every color I'll use later, boosting the lifeless look of the zombies. And I set my zenithal light using white ink. Using the same general light condition on all the different blocks of enemies, I create the illusion of having them in the same coherent environment, setting from the beginning a subliminal but strong sense of uniformity that will tie them together despite their different color schemes. And using a simple, proper zenithal light for this purpose makes this light setting easy to reproduce, even if I paint the various units in separate sessions. To obtain the maximum amount of contrast between uh, these two layers closing the value scale, I'm quite aggressive on the trigger, and I stop only when I have a solid, opaque layer of luminous white on the parts facing up. In the box you have uh, two copies of every model, so before moving to colors I divide them in two piles, to be sure I'll not use the same color in the same spot on the same miniature. This is a classic trick to create the illusion of variety, even if uh, you are using the same limited pool of colors on similar models and repetitive sculpts. At the risk of making uh, huge spoilers on the next steps, at this point I need to explain you my general speed painting plan, to let you understand uh, why I'm using uh, specific tools and colors, painting in this strange, super subtle way. First of all, I use gold and high flow transparent paints because they have straight out from the bottle the high grade of translucency I need to keep as much as I can of the underpainting, but you can obtain exactly the same behavior thinning to extreme levels standard acrylics. The choice of using this line is based only on the fact that I can skip all the thinning and mixing steps, saving a lot of time. Plus, I want to maintain a low saturation, so even if I can obtain a similar transparency spraying pure inks or contrast paints, they are too colorful and vibrant for what I have in mind. And if you want to follow these steps mixing your own colors, I suggest you to use classic acrylics as a base to obtain a similar desaturated look. The airbrush is also part of this plan. 
Using the airbrush on these uh, particular shapes is not helping me at all in making this step quicker, and I'm sure I would have been faster using the brush. But I chose this tool for an aesthetic reason. It naturally creates a dotted pattern and a dusty sensation, especially if you layer colors with a strong value jump between them. Think about all the dots produced by white over a dark base. That is perfect to set from the beginning a rough texture for old rotting fabric. It also increases even more the natural transparency of every kind of paint or layer. So again, I choose to be a bit slower and less efficient in this step to obtain more from the visual point of view and recuperate in the last stages. As you can see, I'm painting a soft base tone only to dresses, hair and accessories, because I want the skins to be fully painted in oils that are the main protagonist of this paint job. I need this high transparency to keep uh, most of the light value of the underpainting, arriving to the oil stage with almost a blank canvas, highly receptive to new colors, and easy to modulate and tone down without uh, becoming too dark. That's a mistake I see happening a lot when you start uh, using oil washes. I use uh, green gold, that's basically plague mirror flash, to add variety only on a couple of skins, and to make the boss uh, stand out a bit more from the bunch. I base a wooden vegetation with a soft, transparent brown. But I immediately reinforce its opacity and saturation, adding also extra realistic tones with contrast militarum green. These elements are not part of the dead rotting bodies, so I make them visually different, painting with darker and more vibrant colors. I use a dark grey to base part of the gravekeeper skirt and the tombstones. Contrast Mechanicus grey has more or less the same behavior and impact. And I add a bit of chromatic complexity, using a turquoise ink as a cold, highly chromatic shadow. Again, I want these parts to stand out as something different, so the higher saturation and coverage is useful to create the visual jump. For the same reason, I use a pure contrast Blood Angels red with a brush, like I did on the skeleton scapes to create an hypersaturated red on the flowers and Gorslav's outfit, that is ideally the uniform that ties him with the general bloody theme of the enemies. I know the explanation is a bit convoluted and based on stuff that is going to happen later, but the actual process on the table is extremely simple and linear. At the end I just sprayed a few base stones here and there, in a very light and loose way, without even worrying too much about overspray and I paint the bases with the same flat opaque layer I used for the Wolf and Watch, just to set all the basic foundational tones for every part. Before painting the few metallic elements, I apply on everything a coat of matte varnish. The oil step in the last video generated a ton of questions about varnishing, and I'll probably need to make a dedicated video about this topic, but I want to solve some of your doubts. First of all, here I use matte varnish simply to uniform all the different finishes I have on the models. Because of their tones and different opacities are perfect for the look I have in mind and the steps to obtain it, I used matte primer, a semi-glossy white, satin golden paints and matte contrast, overlapping their finishes in a disorganized and non-meaningful way, and the finish of this paint job as a whole is all over the place, so I bring all together, making everything matte. I do it now because I don't want the matte finish to flatten the metallic paint I'll use uh, immediately after this, or the effects I'll create with oils and the textured highlights later. And this is the reason why I don't varnish my models at the end of a paint job. A coat of varnish inevitably kills the different finishes and flattens the depth of layers and colors. We can debate about uh, if you need that extra protection, and that depends on how you treat, store and transport your models. But from an aesthetic point of view, a final coat of varnish is the worst thing that can happen to an interesting paint job. 
I paint the metal parts with a mix of scale 75 trash metal and Vallejo metal color duraluminium to obtain opacity and fluidity. And I turn few details into a dull gold, tinting the silver with contrast agarose dunes. This is the situation before oils. Pale colors, uniform tones modulated only by the blue-white underpainting and few stronger use on wood and vegetation. I plan to use a deep red, a desaturated olive green, a light brown and a darker brown, plus black for the bases and few darker touches here and there. The interesting thing is that the light brown should dry more matte than the other colors, because it's formulated to be a weathering tone for dry mud. And for the same reason, engine grease has a wet, glossy finish, and I'll use these properties to add variety and extra visual information. <laughs> I believe I never used oils in the same way in all my videos, and today is not different. I usually work oil washes in separate stages, but here I'm going to use them all at the same time, so I need to prepare all the pools of paint before starting slapping colors around. I thin them down until I reach the consistency of a medium heavy wash. Only black is a bit more liquid to make it flow better on the texture of the bases. The process here is the easiest, funniest and the most liberating you can ever experience. I apply every tone as spots, trying to be as random as possible. The only control I apply is based on the relative values of the part and the color, using the darker tones in the darker areas to maintain a consistent value jump. What happens is a natural wet blending that doesn't even need the help of brush strokes, because diluted oil paint has a low surface tension that creates this natural flow on the edges of the color smudges. The result will be even better if you avoid actively blending the pools, because you can maintain the original color in the center without making it muddy, and the borders blend anyway with a natural soft transition. With this approach I want to obtain super quickly all the unpredictable free-flowing tones of rotting organic matter, getting at the same time a strong definition from the accumulation of dark paint inside the details. The light paint underneath is heavily influenced by these uh, fluid dark tones, and the matte finish created by the varnish, yes, I have an extra secret agenda for using it, absorbs the wash like a sponge in its micro rough finish, retaining even more pigments and tones. I prepare a coffee and wait half an hour to let the mineral spirit to evaporate. Then I start cleaning the excess of oil paint with dry Q-tips. This time I don't use any solvent, because while taking off the excess I want the Q-tip to blend even better what remains on the surface. If you want to push this behavior to the extreme, making this quick blending your main interest, you can use makeup sponges that are made precisely for soft blendings. I personally prefer to use cheap, stiff Q-tips, because they are not able to absorb too much paint, and they produce sharper details, leaving more pigments inside lines and crevices. Cleaning is a magical step that reveals something completely different under the messy layer of wash, something like taking off the masking from a stencil. In this kind of videos it's always difficult to render the real time used for every step, because the quantity of information and logos of the different stages have a different weight, but what I described until this point took me only a couple of hours. You need of course a good understanding of these materials and the relations between them, and make some experiments of your own, but this is how fast you can go when you know what you are doing. This is also useful to say that the next two hours are all spent on light definition and detailing with the brush.
If you feel the need of a wider modulation, you can use a bit of thinner in a second stage to take off even more oil from the highest parts, and create uh, sharper highlights. And like here on the red, bring out more of the original saturation, toned down by the wash. To be faithful to the variety of tones I have on the models and boost their random look, I put on the palette all the tones of the Skill 75 Artist pastel set that provides a light, desaturated version of every tone I used, and for coherency, the same primary red and yellow I used to add details to the Wolf and Watch capes. The work here takes time, but it's extremely simple and linear, and frankly, quite relaxing. The idea is to compensate the smooth look of the airbrush layers and oil paints, adding painted textures in form of highlights, or if you prefer, highlights in form of painted textures. I accentuate the sculpted textures and the movement of the details even more using the heavy body paint straight from the tubes, without adding a single drop of water. Dilution is a tool, and you can always adapt it to the thing you are painting. As you can see from my videos, I tend to paint with the extremes of super diluted transparent paint and thick opaque colors, so be elastic and try to think about the visual needs of what you are painting, and don't fall in the trap of the universal perfect dilution, or the two thin coats. All the work here is made by the tip of the brush, and most of the time I let it flow without controlling it too much, because I'm not painting a geometric pattern, but the net of wrinkles of undead flesh. I have a lot of footage of this part, especially of the work on Gorslav, that being an hero deserves a bit of extra care and details, so if you are interested in seeing every little dot and brushstroke, check my Patreon page and real-time footage accessible to every single tier. And here is the final result. It's been a while since the last time I needed to flex the army painting muscles, and while I'm dusting off old speed painting tricks, I'm finding more and more new ways of using the variety of tools we have now. Plus, in the last few months I work mostly on single, high-end models, and I almost forgot the thrill of having on the table a completed full unit after a few hours of work. Next week is about uh, vampires, that uh, thanks to their totally different look, lower number and the fact that they are almost all heroes, I can change again completely my approach, so stay tuned! If you like this video, give it a like and subscribe! Remember that you can ask me anything down below with a comment, and you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials, and if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page and join the community, or maybe ask for a commission! See you next week, guys!